Welcome to South Point Church Online, wherever you might be watching from today. And if this is your first time, we're so glad and fired up that you joined us. My name is Matt, and I'm part of the team here at South Point. Hey, last week, we admitted a truth about Christmas that all of us need to say out loud. Matter of fact, I'm going to put this up on the screen, and here's what we admitted last week. The Christmas season often adds extra stress and craziness. Maybe if you're watching, you just wanna type in the chat extra, right? Like there's extra pressure and stress every Christmas season. Sometimes it's around the decorations, right? There's just extra pressure. And for some of you, I get it. In the middle of the pandemic, it's not about the decorations. It's about, are you able to pay the electrical bill? But for some of us, it's getting all that together. For others of us, there's extra stress and pressure around buying presents. You know, is our kid's gift, are we gonna get them the right thing? Is it available? Did Did I get the right thing for my spouse? And by the way, this is a secret tip. If your spouse says they don't want anything from Christmas, they are lying. Get them something little, right? And for others of you, you might just be going, hey, my present is going to be able to have a roof overhead. And then there's all the cooking. If your neighbor brings you cookies, are you supposed to take them cookies back, right? Like there's a pressure of that. And then family, having extra family. We all get it. Christmas season often adds extra stress and craziness. We all get that. But last week, we had to acknowledge something even more important, and it's this right here. The present craziness, I mean 2020, right? Like, can we just all admit 2020? No matter where you're at in the globe, there's been a global pandemic. We realize in the midst here in the States that there's been a political election that has been divisive, and there's been racial unrest that needs reconciliation. You know what? No matter where you're at, the present craziness has us weary. Like, we're already exhausted and tired as we start the Christmas season. Now, if you happen to miss last week, no worries. You can go right onto our YouTube channel. I want to encourage you to subscribe, and you can catch up on demand if that's something you'd like to do. Today, I want to let you in on a little secret uh, that I've personally experienced about Christmas, and here's what it is. At Christmas time, we're often reminded of these warm, fuzzy memories from the past. Matter of fact, today I want to share a true story about a warm, fuzzy memory that I have of Christmas. This just happened to me the other day. I, it was early in the morning. I get up before the sun was up, and I was having a cup of coffee, and I turned on the Christmas lights, and you could see the faint rising of the sun, and I was sitting there just drinking my coffee. It was quiet. No one else in the house was up, and I thought of a Christmas past with my two young daughters. They were probably maybe four and five or five and six, but it's a Christmas where one of my daughters, she got a cat, and its cat's name was Fluffy, and we got it from the rescue. And my other daughter, she wanted a bird. We named him Cheeky. And yes, you're probably thinking, you mean you got a bird and a cat on the same Christmas? How'd that work out? It was a decade of fun. But as I sat on my couch, remembering this moment with my warm cup of coffee, um, there was just this warm, fuzzy feeling. Uh, You know, a smile came to my face. I closed my eyes so that I could picture what that Christmas was like. And Christmas brought up a memory from the past that was warm and fuzzy. Now, here's a truth about Christmas as we celebrate it that we often know might be true, but rarely ever talk about or say out loud. And is for all the good memories of Christmas and the warm and fuzzies that we feel, sometimes Christmas reminds us of sad and painful memories. Sometimes we have past failures that create pain or moments that we don't want to remember, but in the midst of celebrating Christmas, we remember. True story about one of those memories for me. As I was about probably 19, maybe 20, you have to understand when I was younger, um, I went into the juvenile justice system here in America in the States when I was about 12 and a half. And so my mom had died and it was my biological dad and my stepmom. And so I didn't go back home ever after that. Um, And so at about 19 or 20, I was trying to see if I could restore some of that relationship. Uh, My biological dad and my stepmom, they had some kids of their own, so I have two half-brothers. And so I went to visit them right before Christmas to kind of see if that relationship could be fixed. And I can remember sitting there. I I remember exactly where I was. I was sitting on the couch. There was a table. I had one brother to the a little bit to the left of me, one of my actually youngest half-brothers literally right in front of me. And I forget where my biological dad and my stepmom were, but I'll never forget we were talking, we were laughing, we were kind of having a good time. And then all of a sudden, my youngest half-brother stopped what he was doing 
And he looked me square in the eye with a dead serious face, and here's the question that he asked me. He goes, are you gonna steal from my mom again? And in that moment, I was heartbroken. The failures of my past were gonna define this future relationship with this half-brother that I'd only gotten to meet in this moment. And so I realized and discovered that as we celebrate Christmas, yeah, there's some warm and fuzzy memories that make us smile and make us close our eyes so we can remember. But also as we celebrate Christmas, there's some sad moments, there's some painful moments of past failures that do the opposite. They bring a tear to our eye and they cause an ache in our heart. And I was wondering today, as we celebrate Christmas, if maybe that's happened to you. And it reveals the truth that all of us experience. It doesn't matter whether you have no faith or different faith or you grew up as a follower of Jesus. And it leads us to this truth this morning. Sometimes Christmas can be a painful reminder of a past failure. This, this happens to all of us. I mean, you, you already know this, right? I mean, Christmas celebrates. You know, we kind of have movies and we celebrate and have nostalgia and Christmas cards around warm and fuzzy feelings of the past. But those aren't the only memories that we have are warm and fuzzy ones. We have some ones that are painful reminders of past failures. So we have to take the good with the bad. In the middle of celebrating the Christmas season, you and I are often left asking an unwanted question that I want us to answer today. And here's the question that is often unwanted that we feel at Christmas, and it's this. Has a past failure permanently damaged my future? I mean, is there something from our past, a mistake, a failure that we made that we're never gonna be able to escape? When my half-brother asked me that question, are you gonna steal from my mom again? It was a painful reminder that I might not ever be able to escape the past failures of my childhood. And maybe you're here and watching today. Maybe you're in the middle of this. And maybe Christmas is, has you asking this. Is there a past failure that has permanently damaged your future or my future or our future? Now, in this emotionally charged question that we're asking today, in this answer, we discover the greatest news ever to hit planet Earth. Not only do we discover the greatest news to ever hit planet Earth, we also discover that even in our pain, we can find joy. Now, as we answer this question, we discover this mind-blowing observation. And so I wanna take a little bit of a step back as we address the very first Christmas. Did you know that the very first Christmas, I mean, one of history's greatest events, actually starts off with one of the most boring and overlooked openings that you or I or anyone could imagine. And if you don't believe me, that the opening to the very first Christmas seems a little bit boring and it's often overlooked. L let me give you what I'm talking about. The eyewitness account of the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew 1, opens up with this, ready? This is the genealogy, which is kind of like the family tree. This is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And then it just doesn't go into the next cool thing. It goes, Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac was the father of Jacob, and Jacob was the father of Judah and his brothers. And it doesn't end there. It keeps on going. Judah was the father of Perez and Zeru, and whose mother was Tamar. And it keeps going through this long, boring list. And I only put a couple up here, but it goes for many, many more verses. And you're reading through it, and you're just going, man, I don't know these names. I don't know how to pronounce them. Some of us might not even know their stories. And you're going, really? I mean, I mean, come on, let me, let's stop and think about this for a second. Come on, come on. I, I know that you might be distracted by kids or looking around, but I, I want you to focus. I mean, if you think about the first Christmas and what the first Christmas really means, that the creator of the universe, God, who spoke everything into existence, right? He decides to leave the comfort and the glory of heaven to come to a busted and broken world where there's no plumbing, there's no electricity, and a conquered country. Not only does he leave the glory and the goodness of heaven, God chooses to show up in the frailty of humanity. And not only does God choose to show up in the frailty of humanity, Jesus was born 
to die. I mean, Jesus came to pay a price for my failures and your failures and our failures. And he did this out of love. And here's the most amazing thing is that he knew that some people would reject him and ridicule him. And you're telling me that the opening part, the, the kind of start of the greatest story in human history starts with a family tree? Doesn't it seem a little bit boring? I mean, Hollywood would start with like the angel's announcement and some kind of grand scheme. But instead, the eyewitness account starts off with a family tree. Now that seems odd and it doesn't seem exciting, but in this family tree, we discover a truth, a truth that answers the question, have my past failures defined my future? Because in this family tree, we discover a truth. So what I want to do is I want to give you six names that we find in the family tree of Jesus. We're going to put them up on the screen. It's this. Jesus' family tree. I'm going to give you three females and three guys. Three girls and three guys, right? There's Tamar, there's Rahab, and there's Ruth. Now, I'm not going to give you a detailed history into Tamar, but let's just go this. Like, she failed in her choice of a husband. I mean, he was such a bad dude that he died. Rahab, well, she was a prostitute, and Ruth comes from a people that treated the Israelites, God's chosen people, so badly that God excluded them from being able to ever be a part of his people for 10 generations. Yet despite these failures of Tamar, Rahab, and Ruth, God still gave them a destiny worth living for. And I'm not just going to pick on the girls. What about David? I mean, David's famous for slaying Goliath, right? But did you know that David was an adulterer and a murderer? I mean, Solomon was a womanizer. He was one of the wisest men, and yet he abandoned God towards his old age. And then Manasseh, he was a guy who just who didn't just abandon God. He went full-scale heathen before he came back to God. Each and every person in Jesus' family tree that is on this here had a failure. They either had a flaw, they had a misfortune, or they had a failure. One that could have dinged their destiny. And yet we see at the very birth of Jesus, this truth, this truth that just doesn't carry forth at the first Christmas, but in every generation since then, that their destinies were not defined by their past failures. No, their destinies were defined by the love of a creator who was willing to leave heaven and put on the frailty of humanity and sacrifice his life on our behalf and conquer hell and death so that our destinies could be secure. So this morning, in this often overlooked and seemingly boring kick off to the very first Christmas, we discover a truth that no one's destiny has to be defined by past failures. And there are three truths in this Jesus family tree that I want to walk us through today so that if in our remembering of our past in this Christmas season, we are asking that question, has a past failure, is it going to define my future? We have an answer to that question that will bring joy and give us hope. And it's the very reason that we celebrate Christmas. And so here's the first truth that I want to remind us that Jesus' family tree tells us, and is this. Failure doesn't disqualify us from a relationship with God. I mean, this is why Jesus showed up. Loved, compelled God to keep a promise, even though it was costly. You see, way back in the beginning, even when Adam and Eve first messed it up, and each generation kept messing it up, God made a promise that he would fix what's broken. And how God fixed what was broken came at personal cost, the cost of his one and only son. You see, here's the great news of Christmas, is that God loved us so much that despite our failures, he chose not to disown us, but to do something to fix what was broken in our relationship true story. Uh, this happened just a couple of nights ago. Uh, my family was around the table. It was after dinner. My wife had done some decorations and I got most of the outside decorations and the tree and the lights up. And um, my kids, they were 
they were having some hot chocolate together. Um, and there's kind of a, that's kind of a thing that we do at Christmas times. We have hot chocolate together as a family. Uh, but there's one time when our girls were younger that that was just an epic failure. You know, our family was trying to create one of those Hallmark moments. Have you ever tried to do that as a parent or as a family, more even as an individual? You know, you see a movie and you want to create one of those moments and you think, ah, oh, that's what Christmas is about. Um, our family had decorated our house and my wife had made homemade hot chocolate with, she had melted the chips. She had got marshmallows right and she had warmed up the milk and we'd gotten our two little girls together and she put a blanket outside and we had turned on our lights and we're going to drink hot chocolate and look at our lighted tree through our big bay window and look at our lights outside and, and we had envisioned this, this kind of ah moment with our kids, right? Except there was one problem. Kids always melt down at Christmas time. Matter of fact, this is just a warning. Your kid's going to melt down a lot between now and Christmas. Love them anyway. And if you're a parent, you might want to type in meltdown in the chat. So anyway, here's what caused the meltdown. My daughter, we had two cups, and one daughter wanted one cup, but this cup had already been given to the other daughter. And she started having a tantrum. She started crying and doing all this, and Molly's like, no, 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 that's not what we're gonna do. So we're literally outside, just the three of us with my other daughter, and you can hear her crying and screaming through the window. And here's the funny thing. It's just because she was being a brat, and just because she was failing. I mean, she was just doing what kids do, right? But she made a poor choice. She failed in that moment. But here's the thing. When you love your kid, you don't disown them when you fail. You try to help them fix it. And you see, you, no matter how big your failure, you were created to be a child of God. And instead of disowning you, God chose to do something about our broken relationship. And so God chose to leave heaven and to be born. And he was born to die to pay the price for our failure so that we could be in relationship. There is no failure too big that the blood of Jesus can't forgive. Failure doesn't disqualify us from relationship with God, which leads me directly into observation number two about this boring opening family tree that we're not disqualified, and it's this. Failure doesn't disqualify us from God's goodness. You know, I've discovered something true. When we fail, when we make a mistake, there are natural consequences. Sometimes we pray that God will take those away, and sometimes, miraculously, God will. But most of the time, when we fail or we make a poor choice, there are just natural consequences to that. But here's some amazing news that I wanna share with you today. Is listen, you know what? The pain of failure is just a chapter. It's not meant to be our whole story. Let me say that again. The pain of failure is meant to just be a chapter. It's not meant to be the whole story of our life. And here's what I love about all those people in Jesus' family tree is yes, they had consequences, and yes, there was pain, and yes, there was failure, but that was only a chapter. It wasn't a whole story. God was good in despite of their failure because God loves us. I was thinking about how to describe this in a story, and, and this is, you know, I've got another true story, so maybe you want to type in true story in the chat, but uh, when I was younger, uh, I have an adopted mom and dad who I call mom and dad. Uh, they took me in when I was homeless and had no place to go, and I remember when they took me in and I had no place to go, I was probably around 16 or 17, they gave me some ground rules. They said, hey, Matt, we'll love you, we'll take care of you, you can have a place to stay. They put food on the table for me, gave me a roof over my head, they even paid so I could go to public school, so I could graduate, right? But they gave me some ground rules. Well, I was a knucklehead. I had some dysfunction. I had some hurts, habits, and hangups that I really was struggling to give up. And, and one of these things I, I led me to do and have some behaviors that were heartful and harmful to myself and to others. And my dad was really awesome. My adopted dad took me out on the front porch. And I remember we sat down and he talked to me and said, hey, listen, son, I love you. Your mom and I, like, we want to take you and we want you to be a part of the family. But you are, you have a behavior like, like that's wrong. And me and my knuckleheadedness, I said, nope, I don't want to stop. And he says, well, then you can't stay here. And so anyway, long story short is I was a knucklehead. I messed up. I did what I wasn't supposed to. Got kicked out of my house and then was homeless again. It didn't turn out the way I wanted to. And I came back home hanging my head. But in the process, I had really hurt my adopted mom and dad. And I remember the Christmas from that year when that happened. You know what I got for Christmas as a Christmas present? a bottle of bleach so that I could have something to wash my clothes with. Not a very good Christmas. I can remember being really sad that like all I got that Christmas was a bottle of bleach. And in some sense, I had probably earned it. Now, the story doesn't end that way though. 
because a couple of years ago, I got a text from my adopted dad. And so I looked at the text and in the text was a picture of my dad's car. Now my dad has a truck, it's kind of a beater that he would drive to work. And they had a nice car that he would drive other places that he kept in his garage. And it was all detailed and waxed and it was looking beautiful. And I said, I I texted my dad, looking sharp dad. And then my dad texted me something that I'll never forget. He says, this car is now yours. It's your Christmas present. Can you imagine that? Going from getting a bottle of bleach to getting a car one Christmas just given to you. And I didn't earn it. I didn't deserve it. My dad just wanted to be good to me because he loved me. The reality is, is God wants to be good to us, not because we deserve it, but because we belong to him, because he loves us. And the fact is, in the midst of pain of circumstances, they're only a chapter. They're not meant to be the whole story. In the family tree of Jesus, we see that despite failures, they were able to experience goodness. Which leads me to observation number three, and it's this right here. Failure doesn't disqualify us from God's purpose. All those people that I had showed you that were in Jesus' family tree, some of them, well, they had flaws, and some of them had some misfortune, and some of them had some really epic failures. And you would assume that those epic failures would have disqualified them from having a destiny and a partnership with God to make a difference. And here's what I discovered is that perfection is not necessary for purpose. But what is necessary for purpose is a posture of humility and availability. Are you humble and are you available? You see, God can use humble and available people. Matter of fact, one of the people on that list, Manasseh, he was a pretty bad dude for most of his life, but he humbled himself and he was available and God used him. And he ended up in the family tree of the savior of the world who came and showed us what life was meant to look like. And Jesus saved us from our own brokenness. They had destiny and purpose. True story, I remember having a conversation with a family member about life choices. And I was trying to explain this. I said, there are two ways to learn. You can learn through personal experience, right? You can run into a wall and go, ouch, that hurts. And you can run into it enough times where you hurt and go, oh, I shouldn't do that anymore. Or there's a second way to learn. And I highly recommend this second way to learn, which is someone else goes, hey, I tried that and that didn't work. And you can learn from someone else's failure. And see, here's what I discovered. Failure doesn't disqualify us from God's purpose because our purpose is to love people. Our purpose is to care. And what I've discovered is is one of the greatest gifts that I can give people is the lessons that I've learned from failure and how God has worked in that, I can pass on to other people so that they can move forward. Listen, failure doesn't disqualify us from God's purpose. God's grace can do what we can't. You know, it's not about perfection. It's about humility, and it's about availability. If I was going to sum up this whole message, as we enter in in the middle of this Christmas season, I would say it this way. Christmas replaces the pain of failure with the joy of undeserved favor. Here's a truth that you know, and here's a truth that I know. Matter of fact, it's a truth that all of us know. And this truth applies to us regardless of whether we're just kind of curious and investigating who Jesus is, or maybe we didn't grow up with anyone actually talking or teaching us about Jesus, or if we grew up as a follower of Jesus since we were a little kid. Everyone fails. Everyone has a failure in their past that they regret. Everyone has a failure that created consequences that we don't want. And that is why we celebrate Christmas, because it replaces the pain of failure with the joy of undeserved favor. God showed up and loved us not because we deserved it, but because he is good. Jesus was born to die, not because we earned it, but because God loves us. And because he was born to die, and he conquered and his tomb is empty, That means you and I are no longer defined by our past. We can be defined by the unconditional love of God found in a person named Jesus. That's why every year, no matter what goes on, we celebrate Christmas because it is not the pain of our past failures that defines us. It is the undeserved favor we find in Jesus. Now, 
as I close this out, I want to close out with a question you might be asking, which is, Pastor Matt, you know, you're a middle-aged dude living in the States, and you're a pastor. It's easy for you to talk about past failures and that God gives you favor. You don't know how bad or how hard or how wrong my past is. And you're right, I don't. But I do want to tell you the truth if you don't know me well, is that I have personal experience with flaws, misfortune, and epic failures. Matter of fact, I bet I'm one of the few people who's watching this that's actually experienced Christmas Eve and Christmas and an eight by 12 sale for more than one year. And I wasn't just in a physical jail cell. My life was a prison. You see, my mom died when I was nine. My biological dad took me to the police station and disowned me at about 12, 12 and a half. And I spent several years in there. And I had a lot of bad habits and hang-ups and things that were destructive. And the direction of my life was headed towards destruction. And one of the reasons that I love Christmas so much is despite all those past flaws, all those past misfortune, despite all those past failures, because God decided to show up because Jesus turned into someone who loved the unlovable and who willingly went to a cross and paid my price and your price and our price, and his tomb is empty. You see, Christmas changes everything. I am not defined and will not be defined by my past failures. Nope, I'm not defined by my failures. I'm defined that I'm meant to be a child of God. So I want to ask you this question. You are not meant to be defined by your choices. You're meant to be defined as a child of God. God loves you. And I want to ask a question. I want to give three challenges today to anyone who is watching this. Maybe you showed up today and you know about Jesus. You may even believe in Jesus. But you've never really said yes to the gift that Jesus is. Would today be that day? that you say yes to Jesus. And you know what, saying yes to Jesus is really simple. It's where we admit that we failed. It's where we trust that Jesus is who he says he is. And it's where we surrender. It's we, where we give the wheel of our life to Jesus and we let him lead us and we surrender. Would today be the day that you actually receive the gift of Jesus? There's some of you watching today, you said yes to Jesus but you've taken Jesus and you've put him in a little box and you only bring Jesus out at Christmas time or you only bring Jesus out when life is hard. Jesus really isn't a part of your life. You've, you've said yes, but, but you haven't enjoyed the gift. You haven't surrendered fully and allowed him to transform your life. So I wanna challenge you today to do more than just say yes to Jesus, but have that surrendered personal daily relationship with him that defines your whole life. And then there's some of you here, you've said yes to Jesus, and Jesus is a part of your everyday life. But have you shared Jesus? I mean, Jesus came to serve and to sacrifice and to set free. And I wonder, are we sharing Jesus with the world around us in the same way that he came to us, vulnerable and as a servant? So those are my three challenges, is to say yes, to actually engage the gift that Jesus is, or to share him. Because the good news of Christmas is that our past does not define our destiny. The person of Jesus creates a future worth living for. Hey, let me pray. Hey God, thank you. Thank you despite our failures. You chose to leave heaven and show up in the frailty of humanity. And you paid our price and you conquered hell and death so that we could be defined by your love as your children and have a destiny worth chasing. God, that is a joy that we can celebrate regardless of what's going on in the world around us. God, I pray that anyone that's here today, God, that hasn't said yes to the gift of Jesus, that they would say yes today. God, I pray that anyone that said yes but hasn't fully surrendered and as you kind of compartmentalize and box, God, that they would engage a personal relationship, not religion with you. And God, I pray that all of us would share you on a daily basis. God, thank you 
that you chose not to disown us, but to do something so that we could have a restored relationship with you, so that our lives would not be defined by failure, but instead by our relationship with you. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. And never forget, you matter deeply to God.